Okay, people. Um, this one is a fun one. Fun week. Fun week. Um, this week will be Star Trek Eight. It says um, adapted by James Blish. I think there's like multiple authors in here. Yeah. So like this first one's Lee Cronin. It's like a, what do they call it? A bantam book. Literally. It's a little book. Now, I had initially thought, because I have like, I have three of these. I was going to do two. So that I wouldn't have y'all with a gypped week. But it turned out a lot meatier than I anticipated. So, most, I'm only going to do this book. And if it ends a little short, I guess it's just short. Right? We'll just have to do it that way. I mean, it's the videos are shorter when it's a long video. Might as well be longer on a short video? I confused myself. Okay, so why did I get this book? Obviously, it's Star Trek. And I love Star Trek. But, um, even even without that, Right? Like, let's say you didn't know any of the characters. you never seen every episode of Star Trek. Which you should go see if you haven't. This book works. It works very, very well. Right? We'll get into it. Availability is an issue with this book. If you're wanting to get it. Now, I didn't, like, hunt across the universe. Right? I'm wondering if there's a way you can read these online somewhere. Some kind of fan thing. But to buy it and own it, I didn't see a Kindle version. Maybe there's like an omnibus. I didn't see a Kindle version. Um, Barnes and Nobles won't doesn't sell it. It's, I think it's out of print. This was printed in like '72, right? Hold on. Yeah, 1972. This is when this was printed. So you you, you can find them. I found some on eBay. Right? If you see them like at a used bookstore or something like this, I, maybe I'd snatch that bad boy because they're they're not available. And so part of me was like, do I go in depth on the whole thing because maybe you won't be able to read it? I, I went I, I I chose not to do that. I'm only going to cover select stories in here, not the whole thing. So there's stuff in it that I'm not going to cover. It's just how I chose to do it. I mean, I don't have to. You know, you don't have to do every little nuance. I'm going to spoil it if you do think you could go find it and don't want to be spoiled. You know, you got to you gotta exit this video now because I might spoil some stuff. Uh, rating. The rating on this is a 5 out of 5. Surprisingly, I think anyone who loves books, who loves to read, us, us readers, we're there for this, right? We, 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 this is what we like. But if you're not a reader, if you're a casual, musty smell, bacteria, if you're just a casual, a rank casual who doesn't like to read at all, I don't know. There's some people. You can pick this up and get through it, and I think you would enjoy your time. Right? It's not. There's not a lot going to get in your way. You go right into it. Even, like I said, even if you don't know the characters. If you do, oh my goodness. It's like I, I'm hearing them in my head. It's like an audio book, almost. I can hear their voices so well. Let's get in it. Um, each chapter is a different author telling a different story but they are unified in universe they're all you know they all have the enterprise spock bones james tiberius kirk the characters we know and love they're all in here nothing happens that will break let's say the canon if that's your issue if it's not you won't be bothered by that at all and 
you would think in a short I wish more authors would would realize this. It's a short book and you would think in a short book maybe a missing detail or world building or something to this effect. What these authors are aware of is that your audience, your reader, the person who loves books isn't an idiot, right? I don't have to describe every little thing for them to take what I give them and go with it. If you say Starship, it throws a lot of things in my mind already. You know, I'm, I'm already thinking space, planets, starships, technology, future. A lot of the things I need to think. I don't, I don't need to a rehash on World War Five to understand that Star Trek's in the future and there's peace. You know what I mean? That they're an exploration vessel. It's the characters will if the characters were violent, right? I would. Oh, they're kind of like, you know, Klingons. They come at you. It tells me something about them. So you can do three things at once. You can you can describe their descriptions of things to describe the world and the characters and the situation. Right. Three things at once. And then you don't need like a book this big and then 90 percent of it's telling me about curtains and what they eat and things like this right it's not it's not pertinent to the story you can move it along and not lose that thing you want to get across I wish more um, authors would realize this you can get a lot done in a little bit of space and have a dramatic story which this one this Bantam book does Story one, and, and here's, uh, again, it gets you quickly. It's called Spock's Brain. I'm like, what? They see, oh, side note, the notes are back. I didn't, I didn't like how I felt with ye old last video and no notes. I was lost without a map. I was adrift alone. We start and they, they see a mysterious, highly advanced spaceship, right? It, it comes on them real quick. Someone from it beams over. Um, they knock everyone out. Then they leave. And when everyone wakes up, there's Spock's body and it ain't doing too well. They get them to, Bones gets them to the medical bay and puts them in stasis. Because it turns out his brain got taken. I mean, this is page one. One and a half. I'm like, what? Somebody took Spock's brain? Spock's brain? Now, again, the conceit on some of these is you know Spock's not going to die. You know Kirk's not going to die. You know he's going to get his brain back somehow. So, we don't... The author doesn't harp too long on that aspect their deaths we know they're not going to happen so rather than that it, he he uses the situation to show me more of kirk right to kirk in the situation he doesn't know spock's going to live that's his buddy what does it say a, a friend a companion through a thousand dangers right i get this deep history this deep french friendship quickly and I'm propelled along right some some of its mystery and some of its not wanting Kirk to feel the way he's feeling right so there's more than one way to pull a reader along even even knowing outcomes right very very smart um Oh, it was a it was a beautiful woman. That's how they describe it. And so, once they stabilize Spock, they know they only got a certain amount of time. They have to find the ship, then find the person, this lady, then get Spock's brain and get it back, and then hope somehow Bones, the Doctor McCoy, can put it back in, which he's not sure he can. Um, in the end, the they find an ion trail to track the ship. But in the interim, we do another thing that is um, 
Hold on. Now, we do another thing that's very crucial to Star Trek, and I think would apply to other books as well. We let the characters sort of have a discussion. Not action, nothing blowing up, not a heartfelt monologue, just a pure, like, normal people, right? Like, the Rona. How, how many times have you and your friends talked about COVID, just in general? They're just, it's, a, it's an event that happens. People didn't talk about the event, right? This is what happens in this book. McCoy and Kirk are, are debating, right? Like, they, they are running through what they know an advanced race because they must be advanced to have the ship they had that can get away from their starship what would an advanced race want with a vulcan brain right it's almost at odds the advancements make it so that you don't have to steal brains right and yet the advanced culture is what stole the brain right there there it's just a discussion nothing comes of it really other than thinking through it, in story, it helps Kirk make sort of decisions, right? Information helps him. But for us, it's just a thought experiment and a fun one at that. And there's no reason books shouldn't give us this sort of thing, right? Which is, I think, why some people like fantasy, to think through what this fantastical world would be like to actually live in, right? But there's no reason it should limit itself to that. You, you can do fantastical, modern, real-world books, right? Like, what if DuPont invented this thing, and then the world looks different, right? We should, we should be challenging our authors to give us a little more. They did it in 72, right? They, they find the, a planet. Right? He had to make a decision. They find a planet. It's an icy cold planet, but habitable. And on this planet, like a primitive type of a, of a man, attacks him. Super strong. He could beat him up if they didn't have a phaser. They have a phaser. They subdue him and talk to him, and he's very not intelligent. And he can't understand when, when they say woman. They don't know what, he doesn't know what a woman is. Right? But they t he tells them something about others. So they find a cave. Their readings, you know, their tricorder. I love the tricorder. Wish I had one in real life. Just to... let me lock onto this thing. It says it's a book from 1972. You know, like, it just tells you everything. Just scan it. It tells you everything. I love it. So they find like a cave, and in the cave is a bunch of food. It's a trap. A trap for these primitive men. Well, the trap gets them, almost on purpose, because they're they're trying to find Spock's brain. And so they get knocked out by more of these primitive men, and when they wake up, they find a panel, essentially, of beautiful women, and guards that are these sort of savage men with collars on. These women are controlling the men with these collars. But in talking to them, they find out that they aren't intelligent. And the way the word they use, now I'll remember, because if you read this book, what you're gonna get is you know politically incorrect and some sexism. It was 1972. They <laughs> it's funny when you read it, because it literally says, McCoy's like, these girls are retarded. <laughs> I'm like, bro, bones, bones, you can't say that, bones. We'll get kicked off the air. <laughs> right? He calls them retarded. I'm like, ah, oh, 1972 was fun. Well, you sort of leave that behind, and they're trying to negotiate with these women. They don't know what the brain is, they, they, and they're still more confused. They're like, how is there this such contrast, right? Above it's cold, underneath it's it's pleasant. Underneath it's nothing but women, above is nothing but men. Neither know who the other is. They seem to be at odds in a kind of a way. 
but but Kirk is sort of like um, kind of headstrong about it. You know, he, he ends up getting the sort of the controls. They hear Spock talking to them somehow, and what they end up finding is they stole Spock's brain to run some kind of system. The system maintains all all of the, all of their needs below ground. So like all the women are living absolutely pleasant lives in this sort of catacomb system underneath run by this computer that's run by a brain. And they're very happy that they got Spock's brain because it's pristine, right? It can run all the functions better than ever. And Kirk's obviously like, you can't keep my boy's brain. I don't care. And so the technology, they put like this helmet on. The technology then is fed into them to know how to work the ship to go get a new brain when they need it. Bones uses the same thing to learn the the ability to reconnect Spock's brain. And that's what they end up doing. So Spock saved. But then like the issue I have the issue I have with it is like Kirk starts to admonish them. Like, you can't live like this. I'm taking your little brain. I'm not gonna give you another one. And the men and women are just gonna have to learn to get along. And he said it's like in a in a chauvinist way, like well, they're going to have to learn, wink, wink, you know, all these men, how, to, how are they going to get along with these beautiful women? Right? And I'm like, okay, 1972, it's a little chauvinist. But in my head, I'm like, um, what about the prime directive, bro? Well, the prime directive means you can't interfere with societies. Right? Now, yes, they're advanced, so, so that's what gave them the excuse that they can go on to the planet. Right? If you're just a full-on savage planet, you, it's like you can't show up because you might affect their growth as a civilization. But even established, that's not a Federation planet, right? They have the right to rule themselves the way they want. They, in their evolution, came with, to a system where there was peace. There's not war between the men and the women. They don't even know each other. There's not any war on the planet at all. That some are living what would you would perceive as more comfort, the women, doesn't give you the right to up in their system, right? Now, obviously, you don't want to take Spock's brain because that's not right. You know, you don't have the right to other people's brains, especially not my crewmen. But I think they should have grabbed like a guy or one of the ladies because apparently the computer can make you smart should grab one of the two, use the computer to teach it, and then use the the same computer to do the brain swap, right? Their society has the right to continue with the setup that they had. But Kirk upends that mess. And I was like, "Mm, I'm a little maybe, I need some clarification. What about the Prime Directive, bro? Now, he's a ship captain. He can do what he wants. No one else is around, but... Right? A little sideways, maybe? Hmm. We'll go go to the next one now. Now, what I would suggest is a, a side note. What I would suggest, if you end up with one of these, one of these bad boys, and what I'm going to do for the other two that I have, I'm going to read one chapter a week, or maybe a day. Maybe a week. I don't know. We'll see. Because then it feels like I'm getting an episode a week. It, it Actually, that's what this feels like. It feels like an episode a week. I burned through it for this video. It's before I knew, right? I read it so that you could know these things. The next episode, The Enemy Within. Okay, it starts with we're on a planet doing some kind of science stuff. It's very hot, but at night it's going to get deadly cold so Spock I mean um, Kirk beams up and something's gone wrong with the transporter and it makes two Captain James Tiberius Kirks the first one feels a little weak and the other one's savage right 
and there's a bit of a to-do first not realizing what happened because they both look the same and he's the captain of the ship so everyone treats him right even though he's like crazy right there's clear personality differences but they don't know yet that there are two captain kirks they eventually find out and well he doesn't want to tell them the crew at first because he doesn't want his command subjugated you know if you're the captain of the ship you got to have all the answers and know what's what even if you're incapacitated so to speak at least that's how they're seeing it what this ends up giving us is a deep dive into sort of the nature of man how we're constructed as like humanity because the one half of him ends up being like the lizard brain right it's savage it's hungry it doesn't care it can be violent and the other half is the morals it it nice and it's thoughtful right but what they end up finding is without that savage part of Kirk he starts losing the ability to make a decision right I'm too afraid I don't have the recklessness that's the other half of me I'd need some of it to make this decision right which is a which is an interesting concept like which what are the parts that make us us right can you be you could you do a thing that's risky or even something that's not like i'm gonna have fun on this roller coaster if you didn't have that lizard part of your brain that's just like go get it would the rest of you just be too afraid to try anything right would you just be a ball of mush that you couldn't function as a person right and then it goes deeper into this concept with what they call a uh, command this is its own subject right like persons in charge managers to a small degree more more so CEOs generals admirals really are highly concerned with command meaning once I am placed in charge what are the rules what are the tips to make me better at it how can what are the things I shouldn't do what should I do how do other men and women not only function but excel in command it's its own little sphere of existence I've heard it mentioned a bunch right you, you read Alexander the Great you read I forget the guy one of the captains got stuck uh, at the North Pole command how did he keep his men together and not die how did he maintain command that's a major issue in real life right so that they do a deep dive into this because Spock's saying you know you've lost it and Kirk starts to realize that without that recklessness he can't be in command but then how can he safely he can't safely see a way to, you know, offload that, at least not yet, until he's completely unable to. They don't want to give that to someone else because it makes too many conflicts with the crew. They're in a dangerous situation. So I like that we do a deep dive into that. The other half of him, like it gets tranquilized and it freaks it out. Like he's an on-off switch, so... The rage part of yourself, the part that just flies forward, that bites, that claws, can't handle defeat, right? That's what this one can't do, and I think that's sort of accurate. Without that other half of you, you just, without hope, right? You, you can't get anywhere. It, you'll just be, you'll be, what is it, destroyed, right? Immobile, immobilized without it. And so neither half can end up working. You can't be all lizard and you can't be all soft and that's what makes the human. Right? That was a great little story. Of course they end up merging them back together. And saving Sulu who was stuck on the planet half frozen to death. Very cool. 
Um, next episode. Where no man has gone before. It's actually the title. Um, they're prepared. And I like how they present this. They're prepared to go beyond our galaxy. Past the last star of our galaxy. So literally where no man has gone before. And he calls all the heads of his departments to the bridge to sort of like brainstorm it. And this is another big deal, right? You, I would read some of these books and the admiral's like, we're going to go to this island. He doesn't just go to that island. He wants contingencies written out of every kind of possible idea you could think of that he will then read through before he goes into it. Intelligence. Information is the most important thing, right, for military command, which this sort of is. But it, it, it can apply to other things, right? If you apply that thinking to your normal life, I think you see a lot of benefits, right? Oh, I thought this through and I didn't do this dumb thing, right? Or I avoided the dumb thing or I brought more enjoyment to the thing that I was going to do anyway. Right? I'm going to watch the game Saturday. Oh, if I think about it, I can eat nachos while I watch the game Saturday. Hold on. I bought taco meat in it. Taco meat, nachos. Oh, oh, wait, wait. Make sure to get sodas. Sody water, taco meat, nachos, and the game? Now my enjoyment just went up. I thought through the contingencies, right? In a, <laughs> in a basic way. But that they don't forget the command structure. It's not just about driving your ship into uncharted waters. It's about you're responsible for every life on board and anything that happens, and you need to be ready to make all of those people survive. You know, you should you should almost think the same way if you drive people around, right? If you and five of your friends get in your car and you're going to go to Austin and have, you know, listen to music or something, as the driver... You're the captain, right? You're responsible for every life on board. And so you if you carry that amount of weight, it helps your driving. Well, they found an object. The object is the remnants of another ship that got destroyed. And so he takes that information into account and goes forward into uncharted space. And it's not long before they're hit with a kind of magnetic field. The magnetic field electrifies some of the crew. And it turns out some of the crew have ESP, espers, is how I'm going to say it, just because it's faster. Um, now, in, in the 70s, there were stories like this, and they were actually true. These are true t things that I want to tell you. The CIA in the 50s and 60s, when we're in deep in the Cold War, which I think is in the 70s as well, but not as deep as, let's say, the 60s. It got pretty intense. The CIA actually spent money and did research and had a whole division of what they called Farsight. They would do the trick where, you know, you hold up a card and the person has to tell you what's on the other side. And if they say it's water, they have this ESP ability. Now, they say, I've never tested it. I don't know. I certainly can't tell you that's a blue mana there. But they say that there are certain people who are above the odds of just random, right? Because it's 50-50 or whatever the number is. Like if it's a playing card... A normal random person will pick Ace of Spades a certain number of times. They'll just guess right, right? You'll guess it right. There's a number to that. Let's say it's 20. ESP people pick it at like 25, 30, or 40, right? They're much higher than random, right? So the CIA found these people, and maybe they used LSD. Maybe not. We don't know. They had some kind of program to amplify this, right? And then they wanted those people to then far sight in their minds because 
just in your mind, what do the Russians have? What what's on their base? And they describe something base, right? Some they triangulate. They they'd say it's around this zone or whatever, right? They they describe something. And then we'd send sort of jets in that general direction, and sometimes they'd find stuff, and sometimes it was very accurate, right? So kind of spooky in that sense. I'm not making this up. This isn't like conspiracy theory. I believe in, in, in releases, they've admitted to this. Mind you, they're spies, so they all could just be a lie. But that's real. Right? So in, in 73, now again, it's the, it's the Iron Curtain. That's real. USSR Russia. And they're, they're grabbing at anything they could think to give them an advantage. And if a far-sighted person can half give me a direction to go, that's better than I had before. Got to send the jet somewhere. Right? So I can see readers. This was more knowledge. Um, this was more common knowledge in the 70s. I could see readers in the 70s making that connection. And not being the concept of espers, ESP, telekinesis, things like this. Not being foreign to our dear readers in the 70s. It shouldn't be to us either. You got to learn things. Helps your reading. In any case... This is what happens in this, with this electrical shock. All the espers get like supercharged. And one in particular, his eyes go silver. And it's like compound interest, right? One penny turns into two, two turn, turn into four, and on we go. And they're saying it like, he's human evolution at that rate. Because we, if we have this ability, in a thousand years it should grow in us. This kind of thing. And he kind of goes mad. He goes crazy. And I think it's one of these, like, the way they say it is he can't control the subconscious mind, right? The, the megalomania inside. And that it turns his subconscious into, like, reality. If, I, if he wants you to bow, you'll bow to him. If he wants to mess with the ship's controls, he can do that easy. Uh, you, his phasers won't work on him. He just keeps amplifying, right? I personally think I could take some telekinesis powers and not go mad dog crazy, right? That's just me. For the, for the sake of the story, he's gone beyond their control, and Kirk thinks I might need to kill this man to save humanity. They beam him down to an uninhabited planet, which had some kind of facility on it, which in my mind, I think you sent probes out, right? A probe factory thing. Which is an another cool idea. I wonder if we'd do that in the future, right? Like, instead of sending men to Mars, if we could invent or build in space some building that could land on Mars, and then with, like, Roomba robots, build the buildings up so they're functional then send people to the building that might work better right because you could just land on mars walk in the building and there's food already growing and it's a running functional mars base and then from there you build on i think that'd be a cool way to like seed planets in the future right just send them real deep and it's just already starting to do its work before we get there churning out what is it? Metal eye beams, uh, wood p planks, all the things we need to build more stuff that people like, right? You need factories. You need a, robots that make factories, and then factories that make stuff, and then we'll use the stuff. But I can see seeding it. Now, they don't mention it a lot here. It's just a concept in passing. But it's very cool. I don't like the concept. And I think that could work in real life. In any case, they go down to this planet, and he has to, like, battle this guy. Because he's James Tiberius Kirk. He can't beat him, but he ends up using the lady, another lady's help, who also has the ESP, but in a smaller degree. So the, the dude dies in the grave. He was digging for James T. Kirk. And the lady dies from wounds taken from the Asper. He was shooting, like, beams out of his hands and crap. It was pretty wild. So I'm like, did he save humanity? Because that's what they were saying. 
they were saying without a thousand years of evolution, we don't have the wisdom to use the ability that he has, even if he is the future now. We can't, we need, we need those years of growth. And I wonder about that. I don't know that we do. I know the concept, but you, we'll see the spurts in human history where we go from like this level and we just rock it up like uh, Industrial Revolution, right? It wasn't, it was a good 20, 30 years, I would say. And we went from like wagons to like flying around in jets almost, right? It went very quick. And we functioned just well, just fine. I and mean, people died, but people always die. But I don't see anything that showed that it happened faster than we can deal with, right? Like they're like, if you brought someone back from Mozart from the past, he wouldn't be able to deal with all the change. I'm like, I think he'd pick it up pretty quick. People, you can take a primitive person from the jungle, and they can integrate in a city in a year, in two years. That'd be a little weird. But they can integrate. Humans have a great ability to adapt. So I don't agree with that concept that we wouldn't be able to deal with it. So I'm not sure this dude needed to die. But I'm not the captain. James T. Kirk is. And James T. Kirk killed him. The last one I'm going to cover. Now y'all tell me in the, in the, in the comments if y'all want me to cover the rest of the episodes. I think it's the two or three that I'm leaving out. Y'all tell me. I'll do it. I don't mind talking about this mess. I love Star Trek. The last episode is Wolf in the Fold. Okay, here... are We have Bones. James T. Kirk, because he's everywhere. Ultimate Alpha Chad, James T. Kirk. And Scotty. The engineer. Apparently, Scotty's had like a relationship issue, and they're trying to cheer him up. To cheer him up, they take him to Argelius, which is, uh, they say, it like an old Glasgow uh, equivalent. So it seems like old timey Scotland. But it's like what they say is a pleasure planet, where all the people want to do on the planet is appease you, right? And however that looks. I'm assuming there's some sexy time because we start with a belly dancer. And um, our boy Scotty's just drooling, right? My man thirsty. <laughs> but it leads me to sort of a bigger question. Again, this is why these books are fun. Is that appropriate? right? Is that cultural appropriation? Because their society, again, we, they live through all the issues to get to we only try and make each other happy. An outsider coming from there is in a different spot, right? They might, let's say, be less evolved. So would it be appropriate to partake in that society's level if you're not part of it? Right? Is that wrong? The flip side of it is, is it just a cultural exchange, right? Like a country loves soccer, they don't mind playing other countries in soccer, right? Even if the other countries maybe beat them or don't, you're indulging with me in a thing that I love. Is that helpful to the society, right? Like the French make bread. I'm not just taking from you. If I take your bread or buy it, I'm promoting you, right? I'm wondering what, what are the two is it? What do y'all think? I think it's fine, right? And they, they didn't have an issue with it in 72, I'll tell you that. But I can see some people now, some millennials now, having an issue with other people indulging in another society's efforts. You see, if that if that indulgence turns into sort of a, a sexual nature, which it seems, it leans that way, it doesn't, it doesn't describe anything. It just leans that way, right? And our boys act kind of like horn dogs, if I'm being honest. Kind of, kind of, they kind of do. But Kirk's an alpha Chad, so he's going to do what he's got to do. Well, what ends up happening on this planet is every woman Scotty's left with ends up like murdered in his arms. Yeah, it's pretty savage. 
Kirk and Bones don't think it's him. He doesn't remember. But they're oh, they're gonna like it happened on this planet. We're gonna abide by your laws. Now this murder hadn't happened in I don't know how long. So their old law is like torture to death if he's guilty. So that kind of sucks for my boy Scotty. Their methodology can't determine the truth. They can't figure it out. They had some weird way where they would like meditate and this guy's wife would like see the spirits or something, but she got stabbed too. So eventually they take it up to the starship. It's pure science. We're going to find out what happens. And what happens is it's Jack the Ripper. And you're like, how? He died way long time ago. Well, apparently Jack the Ripper is a a, a entity made of pure energy. Not a spirit. Literally an entity made of energy that feeds on your terror. Right? So they sedate the crew. And they're trying to isolate it. It goes into the ship for a second. right? It can like run the ship and it's going to use it to kill everyone. Which would have sucked. But they, they like overload the computers with unsolvable math problems. And eventually they get it back in the original host body. Then they beam this body out into space in, a, in the widest arc possible. right? Which is the big question at the end. Because they want to say he's dispersed and he's dead, right? Which, I guess if you're a spirit uh, 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 energy entity, some proximity has to matter, right? I have to, like a bolt of electricity is this long, right? It has to stay together. If it dissipates, it loses its charge, so to speak. But I'm like, can you kill uh, an energy entity? I'm not sure you can. Now, I suppose if he's all evil, right? If he's all evil and you disperse all these little particles on this wide arc and he's in space, there's no way he can really reform enough to do his Jack the Ripper thing throughout history, right? But I can see little bits get picked up here and there. And what is a, a, a molecule, a tiny particulate of Jack the Ripper do if he gets in you? Does he just make you... Maybe your body can fight it off, right? Like a an infection, or does it turn you evil, right? Does it make you just sick? I have no idea, but I like it. I like thinking about this. Like, how would a, a, a creature of pure energy be destroyed, right? So there you have it. Star Trek Eight, James Blish. Go grab it if you can. I like the picture on it too. Also, I was uh, if you saw last week's episode where Peter the Great fell apart on me. This is from 1972. Look how well it's holding together, right? I I, I don't have any of the pages wanting to die. The glue's not coming apart. So there's ways you can do this if you use good glue. Peter the Great, I love you. Okay. This is now the ad portion of the show. Let me see how long this has been going. Ah, I got a decent amount of time out of this book. I jabbered enough. Right? That's reasonable. I want to thank everyone for listening. These are very fun to do. I'm going to thank you in advance for buying my book. Because I know you're gonna. Right? I use hypnosis. I won't use hypnosis. It's illegal. It's got to be illegal at least somewhere. That's why they got rid of uh, subliminal messages, isn't it? Because they thought it was like, that's illegal. You can't do that. My books are good. I think you'll like them. You go ahead and give them a try. Do it. Give them a try. Yeah, I think I might actually just do one episode a week, to be honest, on these books. They're that little. Yeah, it'd take me like five weeks, but five weeks is coming anyway, right? So if you see another one of these on the channel, and you probably will, because you're all loyal viewers, if you see another one of these books on the channel, you'll know your boy took five weeks to read it. It's unnecessary. But sometimes it's fun, right, to let these books... Take your time. We, 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 we readers like to take our time reading a book, right? We like to enjoy it. 
Nothing wrong with that at all. I, because I've given myself this task, have to put the work in. But you can read it however you want. Is that long enough on the ads? Are you convinced to buy my book? All right. Talk to you all next week.